the RTE Rugby Podcast, sponsored by Canterbury. See the new Irish men and women's rugby jerseys at canterbury.com. And you're very welcome along to this week's RTE Rugby Podcast, where we've got a packed series of games coming up ahead of us. We've got Women's Six Nations finishing off this weekend, Ireland against Scotland. That's Saturday night at Kingspan Stadium in the Belfast in Belfast, Ireland, taking the show on the road. They've been to Cork, they've been in Dublin, and now they're up in Belfast against Scotland on Saturday night. And also in the URC, where we've got four games, and each one of them having an impact on the table as well. Munster against Cardiff is Friday night. Ulster and Edinburgh are also in Edinburgh on Saturday evening. Leinster are taking on the Stormers and Connacht up against the Sharks, those two teams on their South African tour. We're going to get straight into it. We've got Eddie O'Sullivan. And Fiona Hayes here joining us. And guys, I think we'll start with the TikTok Women's Six Nations. Obviously, Ireland had a result I think we probably did expect against England on Sunday. We probably won't dwell too much, to be honest, on the actual game against England because there really is only so much you can say about it. What we will talk about maybe, though, is what's coming this weekend. And Fiona, the chance for Ireland to finish things off on a high. Obviously, they're still missing a lot of players, but... Looking back through what Scotland have done throughout this tournament as well, even with the amount of players Ireland are missing, would you still consider them favourites this weekend against Scotland? I think they'd have to be considered favourites as it's at home. You know, I think t- the both teams are even enough at the minute. Um, you know, I thought it was uh, excellent news yesterday, yesterday as well with Nayapu getting that uh, red card was overturned to a yellow card. So she'll be back in that centre. I was I was worried after the game, to be honest, about the lack of, of backs that were available because of poor Emer's leg. And I know Nicole Cronin, um, she's still not 100% ruled out, but... Uh, um, a Scotland team will be very physical, so you'd want to be in, in tip-top shape getting out of that pitch, but I know they're monitoring her, so hopefully she might be back in the pitch as well. Look, it's it's going to be, I, I think it's going to be a tit-for-tat game. I think both teams need to be winning this game. You know, Scotland are going to a World Cup. Um, they, don't, they, they lost, you know, last weekend. It would have been very, very disappointing for them, so, so they'll have a point to prove. Ireland would feel they should be at the World Cup ahead of Scotland, to be honest, except for those qualifiers didn't go their way so it's going to be a grudge, grudge match in a way and I think it will be a good game of rugby and a big point for me is uh, how good Scotland are with Jade Conlon and she's out injured she's unfortunately picked up, picked up an injury and she their number eight she would be really really good for them very physical um, just a, a great player to have in a team she played with Harlequin so her missing will, will do well for Ireland as well I think Yeah Fiona or Eddie Fiona touched on it there like how poor Scotland have looked at times in this tournament, how poor Italy have looked at times in this tournament. I have found it a little bit grating going throughout this tournament, the fact that Ireland aren't going to be at the World Cup in a few months' time and the two of those sides are. I know, obviously, it's it's Ireland's fault rather than Italy and Scotland's, but it does... It, do, it does really frustrate you when you see when you see how poor some of these teams have been and the fact that Ireland missed out on that opportunity through their own fault. Yeah, it was a missed opportunity. I mean, it's been talked about so much at this stage. I mean, it, what, the one thing it, I suppose it did is it did trigger uh, a big conversation with women's rugby. So, like, the little wind that blows no good. Um, had Ireland qualified for the World Cup, I don't think that conversation would have been had with the RFU. Uh, so, retrospectively, yeah, you'd love to see them go on. They are... There are, they're they're worth their place in the World Cup. If you want to put it that way, there, there's teams going to be there that Ireland would beat. But look, that's how the the, the thing works out. And and um, I do think in the longer term, the fact that the World Cup non qualification precipitated um, a pretty strong investigation into the women's game has been a positive. Uh, it's not the way you'd want it to come around, but it, it was a catalyst for something positive. Um, having said that, what we did see in the weekend, I think, is that. The solutions around women's rugby, and not just Ireland, I think other countries as well, is there's no quick fix here. You know, um, you see the level England are playing at in France, not far behind. And there's lots of calls this week for for more uh, interventions like professionalism and um, to players getting contracts and all that. And, you know, I think that's all to be had, that conversation. But it, even if you did all that in the morning, uh, I don't think you'd see any major change between now and even next year, you know? Um, like, it's it's a slow burn thing, you know? You're not going to turn things around overnight. Um, and even the, the whole idea of making the, uh, the women full-time professionals is not as simple as people might think, because the first thing would, would happen is you'd have to ask some of the women, do they want to pick up their careers? 
So if you went to the Irish team at the moment who are not professional and said, okay, well, you're going to be professional next year. So do you want to give up your career in law or medicine, you know, or, or whatever career you have and just walk away from it? It's a big decision for people to make. And, and can you even match what they would earn in those, you know, in, the, in, in, in those professions? So it's like, I know people like to think of silver bullet solutions for all these problems. And that's what we kicked around this week is make, make the women professional. It's, it's not a simple process. It's a slow burn thing. And, um, but I think the fact it's being discussed, you know, it, it's a discussion that has to be had as to how world rugby has to navigate this. You know, if you take a big step back and look at world rugby and this World Cup next year and the teams that are going to be there, right? You've got Italy, you've got Scotland, who aren't really as good as Ireland at the end of the day. If Ireland had all their players on deck, we'd be better than them. But they've got to go in and face teams like New Zealand and they've got to face uh, France and they've got to face England. But then below that, like it's not, it's not going to be a great World Cup if three or four teams just absolutely dominate every other team and, and beat them by 60, 70 points. The truth is nobody wants to watch that. So the world rugby has got to figure this out as well. It's not just, you know, a problem for each individual country because the World Cup, if it's going to be kind of that watershed that we have in men's rugby every four years, they've got to make it a viable competition. And at the moment, I could be wrong here. It could be the greatest World Cup of all time. But I think there is that gap that we have, that we see in the Six Nations is going to be rep- replicated um, across the World Cup. And I don't know if Fiona would agree with that, but I think that's something that's not good for the World Cup either. No, I definitely agree with that, Eddie. I think there is um, huge gaps. I think you're at the minute you're looking at probably New Zealand, Canada, England and France. Um, Canada would be quite good as well in, in women's rugby. Um, I'm sure Australia might think they're up there. That, but um, but I, but other than that, I, I think you will see huge scorelines. And I totally agree. Nobody wants to watch that. I've talked to people about this uh, year's Six Nations as well, the TikTok Six Nations. And it's uh, all the games are on telly. And, you know, it, it can be quite disheartening when, when teams are losing by by, by 60 points or, or 65 points. And you're not going to keep the, the audience there if, you're, if you still have those big scorelines in games. Because people are disinterested or become disinterested and no one wants to watch that as well. You know, we saw Ireland really good uh, first half um, second half just didn't go. Obviously the professionalism kicked in with England or, or whatever way you want to look at that. But, but like you're going to lose fans if we can't like narrow this gap. Any yeah. competition is, is like that, you know, um, what people want to see is entertainment, you know, and, and, you know, this is, there's a risk with the URC for this as well. Let's talk about women's rugby. Like, let's, for example, you notice at the moment in the URC that the South African teams are getting their, their, their house in order. Uh, and you can see that in a number of ways. One is since they've got back home now, um, they've started putting performances together and they're creeping up now to back end. In the, like, if you think how disastrous the URC was for the South African teams at the start of the year, they were all getting beaten up here in the Northern Hemisphere. But now they've got back home. They've figured out how we play the game up here. Uh, they're back in their own backyard where the conditions suit them, and they're starting to creep up the table. Now, that means that they're going to be seeing in the playoffs, which is, I mean, imagine if the URC finding this in South Africa this year. It could well happen because, the, you know, the top seed might host it. So, like, having said that, that's just this year. But next year, what's going to happen? The South African teams are bringing back their internationals from overseas. They're coming back from England. They're coming back from Japan. Um, for two reasons. One, they want to get ready for the next World Cup. And they're also eyeing the fact that they're going to be in Europe as well. And that's going to be big, big, uh, like, pay-per-view time. And there's an, I keep saying this, I've been saying this for years, and I'm not going to stop saying it, because I think I still believe I'm right. It's not long before they're going to force the Springboks into the Six Nations in some shape or form. So, but if my point about the URC is if the South African teams start to dominate like, to like, like they can, we know they've got huge uh, resources in terms of playing power. Uh, they get their house in order. Maybe the Irish teams will always compete. Um, the Welsh and the Scottish and the Italians have struggled year in, year out. It's very hard to find the year, uh, except this year, the so Scottish teams have finished up. But historically, Wales and Scottish teams haven't been... You will always get one Welsh team or one Scottish team that might pitch up. But across the board, nobody has matched Ireland's consistency in the URC or what we call it, the Pro 14 or the Magnus League. But we've always been... The, the driving the bus there with that. So let's say the URC becomes lopsided. And that's my bigger point where, you know, teams are only making up numbers because 
they're getting hit for 40, 50 points every week. That doesn't help the URC either. So it's the same problem with any tournament. I know I'm going to round about way in this, but the women's rugby has a, a, a huge challenge now. It's trying to even up the playing field for everybody. So it's, as Fiona says, people want to wa- watch a good game of rugby, the entertainment of it. And if you're not getting that, if it's a, if it's a done deal before the ball is kicked off, it's a very hard sell to the public. You know, uh, Neil Briggs was talking about, you know, the was asked yesterday about the issue of, you know, professionalism bringing in contracts. It seems like the aim is they want to have some sort of hybrid or retainer contracts in place, maybe by the time next year's Six Nations starts. Um, she made a good point as well, obviously, that there's no point just chucking money at this without looking at the wider picture as well. And she obviously mentioned that if you want to do this right, you got to put a lot of focus into the All Ireland League as well, and I'm sure, obviously, as Balancholic head coach, you wouldn't uh, you wouldn't disagree with that. But how important is it that you know it's not just handing out contracts to make it look like you're like you know like you're supporting this and keep everybody on the outside happy, while at the same time you have to kind of you have to start from the bottom and work your way up as well. You know, you need to have a, a well funded league and a league where that can constantly be supplying players to the Irish team. Well, that's it. Like, uh, you know, Eddie was talking about it earlier about all the logistics behind it. But one huge thing about if you look at the men's game, you know, um, the lads are training in Munster, they're training in Leinster, they're training in Connacht, and then they go up to Ireland for their camps. But they, they're constantly being monitored back, monitored back in the provinces. We wouldn't have that in the clubs here. So they're like, we, we, we have a small interprose with Munster, so everyone is released. So they'd only be playing with Munster Leinster for, we'll say, an average about 12 weeks, um, a lot at a time so when they're released how can you how do they are if you if they're fully contracted players how do they know they're getting the right gym how do they know they're get, getting the s and c how do they know that the the coaching is up to scratch so they have to look at that whole over overload thing or the whole side of that thing and i suppose the ail if they're going to go down that route uh, and really is where they have to really invest in the clubs get that up to scratch so they can trust that when they eventually do and I hope they do down the line when it's done properly give out those contracts players can return to their club and they will know they're being coached properly they'll know that they're being looked after nutritional wise everything and there's good relationships being built up in that way now a lot of the time you don't have that I, 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 I'm I in Ballon colleague. I, I haven't really heard from you know, when I was with Bose, even I wouldn't have heard much from the Irish rugby coaches at the time. They wouldn't know anything about what's going on down there. So you have to kind of connect all those things together and it will and it will take time. And she's right. And and Neve obviously is involved with UL Bose as well. So she would see that as well. But it, it's very easy for people to just throw out this statement and it's not the way if you're going to do it you need to do it right and I think the process also needs to start kick off now and as Eddie said we mightn't see it in the next year we mightn't see it in the year after that but hopefully going in in three years to World Cup which we will qualify you will see that the gap has been narrowed massively well with reference to what Fiona's talking about there um the interface between the professional players and the clubs and um, I'm going to show my age here you're too you're too young to remember this but I remember when uh, there was no there was no professional rugby into pro level. You know, the AIL was the only show in town uh, back in the 90s, the early 90s. And and the AIL was very big in Ireland back then for people who are too young to remember. Like, you were getting five, six thousand 6,000 to games for club matches. But the, the clubs were amateur. That was a crazy part about it. And there was this big gap where a player went literally from playing for uh, Ireland back to playing for the club. And there was interpros. There was about a handful of interpros a year. So the interpro wasn't... But it... It was a it was a huge problem, and I remember when the game went professional. The All Ireland League was still very strong, and when I came on board of Ireland in ninety nine two thousand, I remember going to AIL matches to watch players to pick them for Ireland. You know, and even if they were being if they were injured, they were coming back to play an AIL match. You go to the AIL match, so you wouldn't even con- it's not even considered that now. It's changed so much, but the reality was it wasn't until what really assumed Ireland wasn't until we got a proper tournament at provincial level that was a tipping point in ireland and the, there was talk way way back years ago when the game of professional back in the after the world cup in south africa in 95 that ireland would have professional clubs and the other few fought that off and they took on what was the southern hemisphere model you know having the provinces as they have in new zealand and, and, and australia and south africa and we made those professional whereas and if you think about it england in particular france scotland and wales they went with the club model 
And they all regretted that, I think, to some extent when it came to the national team, because what eventually broke out was a war between the clubs and, and, and the, the unions. And that's been, that's like the battle of the roses in England. It's been on for years, you know. Uh, they, they, there's always problems between the clubs. Now, they've, they've worked very hard to figure it out, but there's always compromises. Whereas here, we have a very streamlined system. That's why, you know, Bundyaki played his fourth or fifth game for Connacht this year, because he's been so busy with Ireland. Like that, it's unconscionable that could happen in England or France. So I, I think the model we have with the men uh, really is the best model for the women. We're never going to be able to resource, I think, professionalism in 20 or 30 clubs, whereas we can manage res and resource professionalism in four clubs. But the problem then, which is an obvious problem, is who do the provinces play every week to make it a proper professional season like they have in England? And this talk of a women's URC yeah. would be a great solution. It would be a great solution, but again, who's going to pay for that? Where's the money for that going to come from? How is it going to wash its face? Because the URC itself is not a wash of money. A lot of clubs, like the Italian clubs, are struggling financially. You know, if you talk to Mike, Michael Bradley, I talked to him there. We were doing that uh, before he left uh, Zebra. I was talking to him in the Zebra game. And like they were running on a shoestring at that time. He said they flew out that morning to Dublin, played the game, and flew home that night. You know, like there's no way a province in Ireland would dream of doing that. So, like, all those things are difficult. So, What's the best model for the women's game going forward in Ireland? Probably the same as the men's model, but where do they get their competition at provincial level? So, like, it, it, there's a lot of there's a lot of things to be worked out here. Um, doesn't mean it can't be done, but I think people throw out you know silver bullet solutions like let's do this and everything be fine in six months. It's nonsense. Like, they, and think about it, you know, rugby one professional in 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 the mid '90s. It's ta really taken the best part of 15 years of at least 10 years to get the professional game for men in some sort of working order and it still loses money. So like it's, it's, there's a road to be traveled here and all the arguments are valid, but none of them are a simple solution. None of them are going to solve it overnight. Yeah. The, the women's URC is a, is an interesting idea, Fiona. And it's funny, Ed, you mentioned it was literally just kind of about to, to segue over to it now as well, because we were on, I was on that call yesterday with Martin and I, the, CEO of the URC and he was asked about a women's competition and look in fairness to him he said it's something they it, it's on the list of priorities it's something they they are really starting to explore now he did kind of caveat it by saying kind of linking it into this is part of a five-year plan rather than something they want to roll out by next season so uh, I thought he had made a good point as well obviously that they want to there's no reason why it has to be 16 teams exactly like the URC is at the moment to use the example of maybe the the super rugby women's competition which seems to have been really really popular going off like every Friday and Saturday morning when I'm getting up I'm seeing dozens of clips out on Twitter of great tries and you know they're really really pushing the competition but it's not as big a competition in terms of the number of teams similar if you look at the the AFLW in Aussie rules just as a as a different example of you know, that is something that has grown and grown over a number of years. It's a slow process, obviously, but it's a very interesting one. Yeah, I love the idea of that I think it, uh, when I heard that I was like, oh, that would be like that's that's an area you need to, to start exploring and going down. If you want the national teams to be playing at a higher level, we've seen you know what England have done with their clubs, and Eddie spoke about that. Um, but we've seen how professional the women's game has gone over there now, and players are leaving all other countries to go and play. Like I've I've, I've had players leave teams in Bows and everything just to go and be able to say they play professional rugby. You know, it's not because they, they really want to play in England or or they love the thoughts of going in there. If there was a competition like that, I guarantee you we, we would be well able to hold on to our own players back in, in this country because, and why shouldn't they? They they invest so much time, you know, people will be under serious pressure trying to do work and everything. So it, it's a, it's a bit of a relief. They still do a bit of work over, but it's not as as intense as it would be over here. Um, So I think that idea is really good, it, even if it was something like um two even teams from Ireland going and you have the Interpros to compete to get to those two spots um, every two or three years or whatever way they want to work it. I agree. It shouldn't be just teams thrown in to be thrown in. They should try and make it as a competitive. And then you have the best players in this country trying to get up to that level and get on the best two teams as well. So it, it, it's the only way forward. Eddie's spoken about it. It's money, money, money. You know, everything is money. So it's it's going to take investment. It's going to take people from the outside maybe saying, look here, I really want to invest in women's sports and, and put money into it. And it, then if they can grow the game, it might somewhat pay for itself. Maybe not 
not fully as any sentimentality aren't even doing that but but you never know it it might eventually get to a level where where you can see there's there's people going to games and they're selling merchandise everything and I think it'd be great as well obviously as a coach I'm excited at, at the prospects of that as well because there'd be far more opportunities for me to go on a coach and take it and, and try and get involved in that way as well yeah there'd be a lot of hurdles obviously still to jump on it Eddie like the finances being the one thing but if there's a time to actually start looking into it it probably is now when you look at how the attendances are skyrocketing for women's games over in England and even as you know the the results for Ireland haven't necessarily been great there is a, a good sense of starting from the starting something here now from the bottom and working your way up yeah and I, you see I, I think I think I think it's been slow in Ireland but I think we're at a point where we're actually making good decisions around the women's game and there's good discussions around it Having got everything right still, like we still had this major fallout during the week about the sevens, women having to leave, you know, and this was coming down the pike and we kicked the can down the road for the first few weeks because we talked about the games, but we never knew was going to happen. But it, what I thought was surprising is that I know uh, after World Cup when the women wrote the letter and said, this is the, these are all the things that we need to be fixed. I thought one of those was on the list, you know, because it had been talked about, it, it was one of the big things on the list, but then everyone said, oh, everything's worked out, we're back. We're all simpatico again. And this problem that was, it's a perennial problem. And it's, easy, not easy, it's not easy thing to solve because first thing is, it makes sense that you, you can't play sevens and fifteens anymore, two different sports. Um, trying to make that work is going to damage one team or if not both, particularly the 15 suffers now when they leave in the middle of the Six Nations. But I don't know the solution to that except to split it and say either play one or the other. Um, and, and then some of those sevens players may want to play sevens. They may want their chance of winning an Olympic medal. And if we make that decision as a union, I say we, like as an Irish rugby union, maybe the government say, well, if you're not going to put your full force behind the Olympic medal, we're taking away some of the funding. Mm. So there's ramifications around everything, you know, and it's very simple again. People saying, oh, this shouldn't be happening. We're downgrading the Six Nations. And that's a valid comment, but there's consequences around saying to them, you can't go to the sevens. You know, like all those, this, <laughs> everything affects everybody else. It's an ecosystem, you know. And, and um, so, like, anyway, I don't know how I got down that rabbit hole. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, it's a good, there's a good discussions around the women's game at the moment, uh, which is good. I mean, those discussions have to be had. Hard decisions have to be made. You've got to figure out ways of making it work, which is kind of what happened in the men's game. You know, there was a lot of uh, strategic decisions made and, and things were changed uh, 20 years ago, 25 years ago. We were in that, that, that space. But it's all right for us to get our house in order here in Ireland. But a URC money work if they get their house in order in Wales and get their house in order in Scotland. I remember, you know, the Magnus League or the Celtic League started. There was no Italian teams in it. You've got to start somewhere. So Fiona's right. Maybe a scaled-down model. But it's no good if it's like, well, I'll say it's no good, but it's better if you kind of buy in from other countries because they're going to benefit as well. And that's the other countries need to come along with us as well. There's no point in us you know, getting better. And then Scotland and Wales don't get better. Or, so it, 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 it's a growth. That's why I think it goes back to world rugby. World rugby have to figure this out too. They just can't stand back and say, like, you figure it out and we'll run the World Cup. You know, it doesn't work like that, I think. And they need to take some leadership in it. But yeah, look, I said it, I'm repeating myself now, but it's a, it's a complicated process to get this right. But I think the good thing is, is it's, it's been talked about and decisions have to be made. And maybe they'll make the odd wrong decision, but in the long run, you learn from those and you make things better. So I think it's exciting times for women's rugby, basically because it's getting a lot more traction in the public. It's getting a lot more exposure. And there's been good conversations had around how this has to be solved going forward. And that's my take on it. Yeah, plenty of interesting times ahead anyway. We'll move on to the United Rugby Championship because we've got four games this weekend with the Irish provinces and pretty much all four have big implications on the uh, the seeding for the quarterfinals. We're pretty much certain who our eight teams are going to be in the quarterfinals, but it's who's going to play who is the uh, is the next question. We'll start in chronological order. Munster playing Friday night against Cardiff at Musgrave Park. Um, before we talk about the game itself, Eddie, Dennis Leamy has been mentioned this week as a, as, as a candidate that Munster are close to securing onto Graham Roundtree's uh, coaching ticket for next season. You've obviously dealt with him down the years as a player. Uh, he seems to be moving well in the coaching circles at, at Leinster this season. Yeah. What, do you, what do you make of that potential move? I think it's great for, great for Dennis Leamy and great for Munster. You know, he's done a really good job in Leinster. 
all the noises coming out of Leinster about Lini is he's really uh, had a huge impact there, particularly as a skills coach around the breakdown. Um, like he played number eight for Ireland. I thought he was one of the most sending number eight for Ireland. The guy punched way above his weight. He wasn't the biggest number eight uh, in world rugby, but by golly, he, he was right up there with the rest of them. Um, and again, around the breakdown, he was he was he was absolutely massive for for a guy. He got in there. He knew all the nuances of the breakdown. So like he's really brought that to bear on his coaching, his knowledge of the of the breakdown. It, it, Leinster have been raving about him. The players have been talking about what he's, how much to prove their game. So it, it's obvious to me like he was working in Munster, I think, at academy level. So I always kind of surprised Munster to let him get away. You know, I thought he's a guy they want to keep around, but he's going back there now, and uh, I think it's great for Munster. Uh, again, a former Munster player, he knows. The DNA and monster better than anybody else, you know. So, um, and I think it's good. For, I mean, Roundtree's better in there well, but like, I think it's good to have monster guys around the team as well, you know. And I think Dennis is a good signing. Um, so yeah, I think that's a massive. It's good for him. It's good for Monster. Probably bad for Leinster, but uh, I don't think Monster people are going to worry about that. <laughs> no, it certainly won't, Fiona. On the on the playing front itself, the win against Ulster last weekend. It, it's hard to actually overstate how important a win that was in, in the grand scheme of things in the league because the implications of, of one defeat and one win at the moment when you're in around that top four or five, you can just see it completely Munster now. They're looking a lot better than they were this time last week. I know the level on points with the Sharks and Ulster, but a far better points difference than the rest of them and an opportunity this week against Cardiff where Cardiff out of contention for the playoffs. Mm-hmm. And you'd have to be targeting, obviously, a bonus point win for Munster, which just potentially makes them breathe a little bit easier at the hopes of a home quarterfinal. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, Cardiff lost at home 6-22. Um, the Ospreys beat them at the weekend. So, look, they're a, they're a team that that aren't really c- clicking or playing great rugby at the minute. So, I think it's a chance for, look, when, when Munster go down to, I think it's on in Musgrave Park, when Munster go and play in Musgrave Park, um, they, they really get the Cork lads love it. The families are out. It, it, it's a great day. So, they, I think they'll definitely be targeting that uh, bonus point and they'll be looking to try and get it in the first half. Um, what type of squad they put out there, they've I think Freira came out during the week and said, "Look, it's it's all must win games now, like you know." So so they probably don't have a chance to to rest guys. But I think the the lads that are coming through, um, have been exceptional. Um, you know, uh, at the weekend we saw um Thomas Hearn. I know he was in or uh, he was sick the night before, so they started Jenkins ahead. But I thought like he comes on and gets a line out steal. He's just uh, he's just he's just playing brilliant rugby, and I think that's filtering down. And anyone that gets on the pitch, you can see a confidence in Munster. And they brought it in that Ulster game. They brought physicality. A lot of people thought that uh, Ulster were going to kick off after that European loss, you know, but and it was going to be a, a tough game. But I thought Munster were, were in control for, for most of the match. I'm not sure about that Low- Lowry playing at 10, whether that worked out well for Ulster. A lot of people kind of thought he would be good in there. I, I, I wasn't too mad in it. I didn't think the partnership with Cooney was great, but I, I, I thought Munster were far more clinical. Ulster had possession, they had a lot of the ball, but it was it was. Conway or uh, Carberry just it was just a good physical old school type of performance by Munster yeah and Eddie before, we'll move on to Ulster in a second but results aside from a Munster point of view the last few weeks are they playing a better brand of rugby are they playing a more attacking more adventurous style of rugby than they had been earlier in the season well there's two things that, there's two things that have changed for Munster in the last couple of weeks and if you go back to the Leinster game uh, in, in Tone Park, where they were beaten out the gate four tries to one, like it was an embarrassment from Munster to be beaten in Tone Park by Leinster with that many tries, you know, it was awful. They played really badly and Leinster really weren't even fully loaded, you know, so th- that something had to change after that. Then they went to Exeter and they, they were awful lucky in Exeter. Exeter blew 20 points, like they left two or three tries behind a minimum. But after the Exeter game, there's two things changed. Well, one particular for the Exeter game at home is they absolutely destroyed the Exeter breakdown. They had, I think, nine turnovers at the breakdown, and that just completely derailed Exeter. But the other thing that changed is, if you notice it, that the number of line breaks against Munster have dropped dramatically in the last couple of games. Like, Exeter tore them to shreds in Exeter and, you know, basically threw away a good chance to score. But they had Munster and all sorts of trouble. And the huge problem was that in the 13th channel, where, where, where Chris Farrell was... I've got to turn off my phone, folks. Sorry. This podcast is terrific. Um, um, but uh, the problem was for Monsters and 13 Channel, where Chris Farrell was struggling very much so, you know. Um, and you saw that in Exeter. You saw it against Leinster. 
What they've done now is they've changed their defence. They're playing a much softer, old-school drift defence. And Exeter got the ball to the wings in Tone Park, but they couldn't get around the corner like they did at home in Exeter. And basically, those two changes to Munster's t- t- tactics, they destroyed the Exeter rock, and they gave them no line breaks out wide, and that was the winning of the game against Exeter. So they brought that same defensive scheme to Ulster, and instead of playing aggressively off the line, they let Ulster move the ball to the outside chance, which is what the drift defence does. It says, we know where the ball is going, we know where it's going to get to, but we'll be there when it arrives. And that's what they did. It. They had a really soft drift. They come up, they take the gain line, and on the second pass, they push. And then they trap Leinster or Ulster out in the outside channels. And then Ulster coming back from the outside channels, they, get, they meet, you know, the first rock is a car wreck, and Munster win that collision, and then Ulster have no go forward. And that's why Ulster threw the ball around a lot and went nowhere. So Ulster needed to adjust to that defensive system. The way Ulster played on, 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 on uh, Friday night, was basically never going to break down Munster with that soft drift defence. That's why you saw why else were so frustrated. They had plenty of ball, as Fiona said. They threw it around, but it went nowhere. So Munster have made this adjustment to their defence now, which is really working nicely for them. Um, so I think that's a good thing for Munster. They're, they're not going to be in trouble defensively unless some team goes out and picks them apart with a different shape. You'd think somebody would think of doing that between now and the end of the of um, the, the URC. But they've now put themselves in playoff territory at home. I have no doubt they're going to beat Cardiff. If they beat, they don't they lose to Cardiff and Cork on Friday night, they'll shoot themselves in the foot. Because let's say they hadn't won last weekend, you know, they had lost up in Ulster, they'd be down in seventh or eighth now. That's how tight it is. So I don't see them mucking this up. They're going to get a home quarterfinal. And then, you know, playing Munster and knockout is never a good day out. Like it's a tough day out. You're going to have to play a type of your game. Nobody's looking forward to that. So I think they're in great shape at the moment. I think I think the the the, uh, the game against is uh, Cardiff's a done deal unless they screw it up royally. They're going to be in prime position at the end of next week. All right, moving on to Ulster, Fiona. How badly do they need to shake this this kind of European hangover that this that they clearly had last Friday against Munster? Because if you look at their two remaining games, like it's they're tough games. It's Edinburgh away. Edinburgh, who okay, they're seventh in the table, but they're only two points back from from the top four from the home quarterfinal. So they're obviously very much in the hunt to be getting into the top four and they're going to be going all out this weekend as well. And then in the final game uh, later on in May, they've got the Sharks at home, the Sharks who they're level on points with at the moment and who you'd assume they're also going to be vying with for a home quarterfinal. So they've got themselves into a really tricky position when maybe four or five weeks ago, it looked like they were pretty much guaranteed a top two spot on the table. Yeah, definitely. I, I, I think I think you said it right, that uh, hangover. You know, I, I I thought they would have played a lot better rugby. I thought, as Eddie said, they would have adjusted to what Munster were doing. We didn't see that. Um, I thought they lo- they lacked physicality. I, Vermeulen obviously wasn't playing. He was he was a big loss to them. Henderson had a good enough game, I thought, but but it's it they just look they don't look themselves like we were talking about at the start of the season. You know, we were we were so we were we were I was Hume, I, I McCluskey, you know, they're great players. And when they connect and get the ball to Balakoon, etc. Like they've played great rugby. We quite haven't seen it in the last two games. It's like there's almost an air of nervousness about them. Um, I I felt anyway, and and I think they've huge games ahead. I think the, the Sharks at home will probably be the defining moment. When they play in Kingspan, they have been outstanding. Obviously, we haven't seen that in the last couple of games, but but going to Edinburgh is going to be a very tough ask for them as well. They're they're a team that have kind of constantly improved over over the season. They didn't start great, but but I think they're playing much better rugby and they're starting to get their flow. And this Ulster team don't seem to have it. But I, I, the players they have and and the type of rugby they can play, I think they just need to relax. They need to settle things down and and not just throw the ball around. They need to get go forward ball, and we saw that from for Mullen. We saw it at times. So I think they need to kind of take it down a notch and then earn their way to get those uh, back plays and that's what they were doing they were getting a lot of gain line earlier on in the season against teams and I'm not seeing it as much in the last couple of games Eddie uh, Michael Lowry's out half is something that was mentioned a little bit earlier on as well you don't think it worked at all no I think it's tough on the guy you know he's a he's a great player I like him I love Lowry I thought he did a fantastic season um broke his way into the Irish setup like, especially a guy of his stature, you know, who's not a big man, but geez, he makes up for it and his, his speed, his, his agility, his bravery, you know. So I, I think it was a really bad decision. 
to play him there for for lots of reasons. One, it's like just throwing a guy in to 10 out of the blue like that from a fellow who's been playing at 15 for, you know, in the Irish setup, uh, didn't make any sense to me. Like they were kind of setting him up to fail. Uh, and he didn't play particularly well. He looked out of sorts. He wasn't, he wasn't, he certainly wasn't attacking the Galen, which you'd think if, if, if Laurie's ability to attack the Galen at 15, if you put him at 10, that's the one thing you do is he'd go to the line. He didn't go to the line. He was literally like just take and give all night. He never really threatened the game line. Um, and that's why Ulster's defence or Ulster's attack uh, was easily defended. Like there was no threat on the inside and Munster could push off them very comfortably. But so the second thing was then is that they had a solution. They need Madigan on the bench. Uh, and but Madigan should have started that game, I think. It was a major flaw. I don't know what their thinking was. I don't know what the logic is around it. But, you know, they certainly... I think what Fiona talked about is I'm looking out of sorts. I, I don't want to blame Michael Lowry for this, but I think he was, him being a 10 really didn't give him their usual mojo. And you can't blame him for that. That's like, he's not, he hasn't played enough at 10. I'm not saying he couldn't be there at some point, but you just can't throw a guy in at the tail end of the season who hasn't played there really at all and expect him to be all that and everything to everybody. Uh, so they either need to get Madigan back to 10 um, or, or Billy Burns got to come in and, and, you know, do his job. I don't know if, what the story is on Burns, but the Lowry experiment didn't work and it was a really bad time to run that experiment. If you ran that experiment in September, you can recover from it. Literally here, they may have played their way out of a home. They may have put themselves out of a home semi a quarter final here because if Edinburgh beat them on the weekend in Edinburgh, they jumped right over them and up into the top four. Uh, so it, it was a really bad tactical decision to put Michael Lowry in and that's no reflection on Lowry I, I, I have huge time for Lowry as a player I think it was quite asked him to do too much at that particular moment it was a bad, it was a bad decision in terms of selection and they paid a price for it um, you know had Madigan start at 10 they might have won they might have beat Munster you know they had a very bad start but they really came back into the game and got their dander up and Munster were struggling a wee bit but they just couldn't make it happen they'd done too much damage in the first half to recover it you know so Ulster are teetering on the brink here, and what has looked like a hugely promising season from could could possibly you know drift away from them. Hopefully not, because they had such a great season, they deserve better. But you need to keep your foot in the pedal this time of the year. Yeah, it's been a really costly few weeks for them. Uh, the other games this weekend, what's really interesting, Fiona, at the moment is that like the way that se- uh, second to seventh place mm. in the table with just four points separating them, like pretty much every game is important for multiple teams and if you're if you're Munster and Ulster you're pretty much watching a half dozen games or you're watching a half dozen games this weekend that are important to you but uh, the Stormers against Leinster just as it's important for the top two in the table it's also important for positions three four five and whoever as well Leinster yeah. get one more point to be guaranteed top spot and have a home semi-final or a home, or home quarter final and potentially home semi-final locked in as well the Stormers up in second place at the moment I mean if Leinster could go out and win, not only is it fantastic for Leinster, but I'm sure Munster and Ulster wouldn't be too disappointed either. But the Stormers likewise have been playing some fantastic stuff at the moment. Like this one set up really, really interesting. Yeah, I think that's going to be a, a great game at the weekend. Um, you know, fair play to Leinster. I, you know, they the likes of Brian Deeney, John McKee, Lee Barron flown out like last minute. I watched that game, you know, I thought that it was a loaded, it was a loaded Sharks team. You know, I thought, God, their Sharks are going to do like run away with it in the end. But I thought Leinster done really well. I know they got um, stick off some of the media for maybe not bringing the big guns over, but they've earned that through the season, the the right to rest those guys. Um, So I think that Stormers is going to be an absolutely cracking game. Stormers uh, back three attack has been just outstanding. You know, they've, since they've gone home, we've seen a different team. Um, They love to throw the ball out. They keep that weight. They're going from side to side, but have a really strong pack as well so I think it's set up to be a really really good game and I'm not sure if Leinster will do a uh, monster and the lads a favour but hopefully we, we we can get the win they can get the win over there Yeah these games are set up really and it's the same with Connacht and the Sharks as well Eddie like it's you know a win for, for Connacht it's not really going to do them much good this season their, their playoff hopes are over as well but at the same time they can they can pretty much lob a grenade into that uh, into that playoff race if they can go and win in Durban Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But I think Connacht are try- in a, a different mission now. They're trying to set themselves up for next year. Uh, their season is pretty much over in terms of, you know, they know the end of the season is coming now. Uh, they've got Treviso at home the last last game. I'm sure they'll have no problem 
putting in a big crowd that day and having a good day out. But if they could pull off the the win here against the, the Sharks, that'd be that'd be really good because it'd have been a great trip from down to South Africa. Um, it still doesn't mean their problems haven't gone away. Like they, they won last week and it was like they dug out a great win. No question for it. I was working that game um, uh, uh, on TV and and it was a game that they really had to work hard for. But they're all foibles all season. Their defense was shambolic again. Like they just they're not defending. And as a consequence, the problem was that they, they nearly lost the game. They could have probably won comfortably. No, I'm so delighted they won it because it would have been a long week in South Africa after losing that game. But having said that, um, it's still going to be tough for them, you know. Um, but it, 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 it's all about, for Connacht, it's all about them at the moment, trying to build for next season. I think they're not thinking about that now. So given that, you know, let's hopefully they get, they get a good end to the season and something to build on, you know. Yeah, like on that, Fiona, like it was obviously great mm-hmm. for them getting the win, just the second Northern Hemisphere touring yeah. side to get a win in South Africa. But as Eddie kind of alluded to, the, the flip side is if, if you need 33 points to win a game away from home, you're, you're going to find yourself in a lot of tough situations throughout the course of the season. Yeah, that's exactly it. I, I was watching uh, Bristol as well uh, 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 over the weekend um, against Gloucester and, you know, they're in a similar position. They're scoring some really nice tries, but the defence is, you know, they have to score an average of scoring like 30 points a game, but still losing. And, and, and we see this with this kind of team. You know, it was, it was a good game. As Eddie said, they've tried, they've only flo- they've only taken guys over that will be around next season. So you can see what what, what he's trying to do. Um, it's, it's entertaining rugby, but defensively, if you're going forward you can't be shipping 30 points against uh, this Lions team either so look th- that's an area obviously he's going to look I like his style I like the way he plays whether he has to adjust the defence next season going into that I know he he's spoken about that's that's just the way it is you know and that's that's how he wants to play but like as I said you can't if you want to uh, succeed as a team and if they want to find themselves involved next year and involved in the biggest games I think defence is definitely an area Connacht need to focus on because we know how magical it can be off the ball and especially their their launch plays from set pieces are amazing at times you know but they've definitely got to work on that defence Yeah they certainly do so that's the the four URC games this weekend Stormers against Leinster will be live on RT2 on Saturday afternoon coverage starting at 445 and that'll be followed straight afterwards in RT2 by Ireland against Scotland in the TikTok Women's Six Nations. Also Sunday afternoon, just very quickly as well, Ireland, All-Ireland League final, Clontarf up against Terenure. First final for Clont- for Terenure. Clontarf has been around the block a few times down the years. They've won some finals and they've, they've lost some finals. Fiona, you were up watching one of the semifinals at the weekend, were you? Yeah, I went up to the turn your lens down game. It was uh, I w- was unsure. I wanted to go see Carcon, but someone I knew was going to the the turn your game, so I said I'd uh, take a trip out there. And it was absolutely, it was a great game, Roby. That uh, that turn your uh, pack absolutely dominated Lansdowne. The scrums were just immense. The guy should. It was. I thought them, that the pack might have faded. Turn your pack in the second half, but uh, they kept up. Jordan Coughlin was really, really good as well. So I think it's going to be a, a great game, Roby be um you know a lot of people I don't think enough people go out and watch AIL to be honest with you because the the standard that I saw I saw Charlie Tector with the 20s um he probably would have been a little disappointed with Lansdowne he missed a, a conversion near the end that could have even things up but but just the the play out there was was really good and I think uh, this Clontarf team I know they've been excellent all season and um but I'm not sure how I'm I'm not sure how many academy players will be released to them so I think it will be a, a good game to watch a, a really good AIL fighting yeah, it should be interesting. And 10 euro, you could hardly spend any better this Sunday afternoon. Eddie, where are all the Munster teams uh, at the moment? <laughs> oh, oh. Cork Con in, in in scraped into the playoffs. Gary Owen, yeah. you know, Munster's missed out in the playoffs as well. I mean, it, is it a little bit of a worry we've, we've the Dublin dominance creeping up again? Yeah, but I think the swings and roundabouts on that. You know, Munster had a day in the sun as well. Like the Cork Con have been an ever present. Cork Con just had a bad start to the season, but they recovered well. But I, I think you find that, you know, uh, the monster teams will, will you know, come back again. That's, that's always happens. There's all the strings around the most of the tournament. But as a product, it's fantastic. I've covered a few AL finals back over the years with RTE, and um, they've been fantastic games. Like they've been absolutely outstanding to, to watch. Uh, like, and they're very high standard. Like they're they're not, I know they're not professional, but they're not far off. I mean, you get to that end of the season, you've two very good teams like you have next weekend going hammer and tongs at it like it's great entertainment and it's really high quality rugby and if you get a good day like the weather has been at the moment I've been on a few of them and the sun's shining in Diviva and it's like it's a fantastic day out 
but um, and it's you know the I suppose that's the, the thing about the AL. It doesn't get as much coverage because it's down the the food chain in terms of professional rugby and all that. But it's a uh, it's a really good product. And um, but yeah, I, I think the monster teams will, will come back again. They 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 might be down to one, but not for long. Fingers crossed. We'll see how that goes. But yeah, that's three o'clock this Sunday afternoon at the Viva Stadium, Clontarf against Terran Euro tickets, ten euro. I'd advise you to get out there. And the weather forecast is meant to be good as well, Eddie. I checked there this morning as well. <laughs> Sunday. Yeah. Lovely. Yeah. All going for a good day out. Good stuff. We'll see you next week, folks. The RTE Rugby Podcast, sponsored by Canterbury. See the new Irish men and women's rugby jerseys at canterbury.com.